that we last left you at 5 or 5.30 yesterday and you're back at 2. And of course, I don't know how much work you expect us to get done between that time if we have to sleep. And yesterday we slept, actually, and we also went to Greensboro, where we walked up and down the street, uh, their main street, which seems very long indeed. And as you know, that very long street is about half the size of what we are proposing for you in terms of your main street. So there's absolutely no chance whatsoever that your main street's going to be too short. Okay. Now, uh, well, they plug in, and an extraordinary amount of information flows in. One of them is that uh, when we stirred the pot about doing a road diet on the on the uh, main street, which of course means not only burying the cables, but we said we proposed that the money we save by shortening the main street can actually be used for trees. It turns out that different members of the Public Works Department began speaking to each other because we're asking for drawings. And it turns out, by the way, this is bad news, in case you're thinking it's going to be a good story. It turns out that your water and sewer is a complete mess. It's 100 years old, it's leaking, it's everything else. And what you're about to do is to fix the surface perfectly to a very high standard, and underneath all that is everything's leaking and cruddy and making a mess, and which means that sooner or later, uh, it has to be dug up again. So we discovered a problem which would have to be caused. And so uh, this might hold things up. I don't know what that means, but it's a tough decision to say whether you move quickly or you, you have to dig it up. Um, so that's the kind of thing that comes up. Now what's interesting is that, is that because we're stirring the pot, the department, the people within the same department are talking to each other. You know, the, the surface people are talking to the pipe people and so forth. And it's, I, mean, I think this is going to be on the whole a very good lesson, even though what we discover may not always be a great idea. Um, is this the entire presentation? I'm going to wear the one. What are these? That's later? That he put it. And, and then that's yours behind? Yeah, this is all the That's yours behind. Okay. okay. So I'm now going to. The um, question I was asked is how, uh, for how many of you is this first meeting? Up, 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 wait, let me see. Half here, about a third here. Okay. Um, I think at this point you're going to have to get a uh, to get a full presentation. You can always for the full presentation this next Wednesday. If you want to catch up in the meantime, the one of last when last Wednesday is uh, is posted on uh, on Facebook. You know, which a lot of things are, are detailed. And the reason is, although we're going to try very hard to show you show you everything, uh, you, we always we always what, what I might not have time for is the reasoning behind it. Okay. So. Uh, the, uh, the situation is that we're working real time. The longer we take to prepare for your presentation, the less time we have to work. So basically, we uh, have asked people to start, uh, uh, to start literally half an hour ago. Just take it off their tables. We're trying to squeeze the last, you know, the last hour of work, take it off the tables and show it to you. One of the things we tried to do this morning is to, uh, is to outline what the, what the report is going to look like. Uh, so that we have a common vocabulary. We're, we're beginning to speak uh, a language uh, so that when uh, we refer to this building or that building or this project or that project, we know what we're talking about. By the way, we need it internally before you do. But afterwards, when it's on your, uh, when, it's, when, it's, when it's your responsibility, you definitely need to have names. Um, I might, um, we did our best this morning uh, to come up with certain names. And uh, also the outline of the of what the report looks like. We're going for a very short report, you know, uh, something that you might actually want to read, no filler, um, and uh, illustrations that clarify things. Almost certainly, we cannot assign responsibility. You know, we can't say, well, this will be done by this institution or that person. You know, sometimes we can. 
Sometimes we can say, well, that's done by that department or that department. In this case, we can say these are the these are the special projects. Who's going to do them? Um, basically, I expect the city manager uh, will uh, will assign them, bring them up for a vote, and so forth. You'll hear more about that. Okay, so let's see. What the outline that we have is there are certain premises. You know, you want to know because uh, people sometimes ask why you're doing this. And uh, then there are the pros of your situation, the good things, the bad things, and then what is to be done, which we've cut into special projects, transportation projects, and then procedures. And I'm going to go quickly to give you an outline, and then we'll go back and we can tinker with it. Okay, some of you already know what we mean by this. but So let's start. Okay, High Point, despite its name recognition, constantly brought up, it's high tax base. You do have somebody paying a big chunk of tax. It's civic involvement, which is undeniable. These are very well attended charrettes. And your uh, uh, string and splinter club, it's really unusual to have that many people. The fact that this charrette is happening at all without having a crisis is a sign of civic, in, uh, civic involvement. And I think I should emphasize, when we come in to do work like this, is because you're having a crisis. The city's having a crisis. This city is not having a crisis. You simply want to get better. You know, whatever you think is wrong with it, it's not a crisis. It's just a little boring, <laughs> but that's not a crisis. <laughs> okay. So I think it's very interesting and hopeful that you uh, want to get better, just for the you know for the principle of getting better. So the civic involvement is very high. You do have e excellent higher education. At least two institutions that are not only excellent, and even if they're not quite excellent yet, they are speedily becoming excellent. That's very important. However, it is vulnerable to a monoculture, which is the, the international market, and that monoculture undermines the life of the downtown. And of course, uh, what, uh, and let's go through that. But the monoculture, and I'm not adding that the monoculture is dangerous, because if they decide to leave, which by the way, it's not like they haven't tried twice before, you're left without even a tax base. So I expect that one of the premises I should add here is that if they leave, you need to have an alternate tax base at plan B so that you basically switch, off, switch out of the furniture mark into something else. Right? And if you don't have to switch out, well, you have double the tax base anyway. That can't hurt. Because right now, you have exceedingly low real estate value and virtually no other businesses other than the ones that are, that are as a result of the furniture mark. And that's, that's a, a very scary monoculture. So let's bring that up. And, uh, and that's the premise. We're going to, okay, now, the pros are name recognition. Uh, of course, that was the summary. Now, there's some people are going to read the first sentence. That's why we put everything there. If you only read the first sentence, You've got it, but here it is. Okay, there's name recognition. This will be discussed. What does name recognition mean? By the way, um, it's probably eroding. Name recognition, you've got to, you know, it's not what it used to be. The high tax base, almost exclusively from the International Market Center. And by the way, you pay much higher taxes than other municipalities, like Greensboro. That's not a very good sign. Exceptional civic spirit, excellent higher education, Central location on the triad. This is very well located. This, in fact, is the center of the triad. If you analyze, it's really extraordinary how everything has to cross. Uh, it has transportation potential because of that and the proximity to 330,000 students. And uh, uh, it's something that may or may not be here, but within a 75 minute drive, there are 335,000 college students. I've never heard anything like it before. And within an hour drive, there's 225,000. And that is really your future if we can get them to come here, not just for entertainment, but to actually uh, uh, start businesses and so forth. That's really the asset that we need to tap into. Uh, uh, you also have a craft and manufacturing tradition and ethic. Not just a tradition, but there's a work ethic. Somebody added that today. We have a work ethic. It's not just that we know how to do it. We want to work. And then you have a low crime rate. And uh, that's neither here nor there, because that can change in a minute. But, uh, but you do have a low crime rate. That doesn't mean you don't have a perception of crime. Whenever you have empty streets, they don't feel safe. Right. 
And I actually think the perception of crime is just as important as the actual crime. Okay, the cons are you're economically vulnerable. You're dead, literally dead, 50 weeks of the year. And by the way, excluded the other two. You know, if you're not, if you don't have a, a card. You have a small and middle class. You know, we've heard about that. That happens to be aged, which I added personally. <laughs> <laughs> the hardest thing for us to confront is you have a whole bunch of sealed buildings. You know, uh, it's hard enough to revitalize an empty store. What about an empty store that is leased and and uh, and locked? You know, honestly, what are we supposed to do? You know, and uh, you have a paralyzingly. This is I'm flattering them. You have a paralyzingly careful bureaucracy <laughs> who cares desperately about your health and safety uh, in case you trip over, you know, a few fractions of an inch. They're taking care of that, and I didn't add this because I didn't particularly feel, actually, I'm, I'm surprised at how many good restaurants I've been to. They happen to be in suburban sprawl. But what they mean by food desert is buying food. You know, it's hard to, particularly down in our area, to buy good, healthy food. So you have a food desert, those are the cons. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. You say dead 50 weeks a year. Is the furniture market one week or two weeks? I mean, well, it's 52 weeks of the year. So two weeks, I figure it's out of commission. Well, I thought it was two weeks in the fall and two weeks in the spring. No, it's just one week. It's just one week. Oh, you get, one you get people moving in and people moving out. There is a build up. There's a shoulder that goes up yeah. to the and two then, weeks. Yeah. But essentially, you know, I could say 48 weeks out of 52, frankly, but I, I haven't experienced that build up. But, but it's, it's pretty much 50 weeks, and then it's suddenly alive in 50 weeks. Actually, I should add as a pro, you guys are logistical geniuses. Okay, that, could, you, could you write that down? Because the ability to feed and house and transport suddenly 80,000 people is amazing, and we want to tap into that. So that's logistical genius, literally genius. Uh, okay, what is to be done? To foster multiple economies, not just a second economy, but multiple economies. Uh, other things to do, to foster year-round activity, to tap into the students, and to tap into the craft. I think we'd come up with more of, you know, like, can we have a good time downtown and so forth. I think, I think some things will flow from this. You know, tapping into the students means that you'll have activity. But if we could actually keep this simple, but of course I'm very willing to add anything once you look at this, okay? So we're gonna, this is what's to be done, and this is what we propose to do. Okay, there are special projects. Special projects, some of which are first generation, and could you make a note, some of them are first, and some of them are second generation projects, okay? Uh, the first one is called the DOT. And the dot is what used to be called low point, which is that decrepit parking garage, horrible, marvelous area behind Main Street where we can have fantastic uh, uh, concerts and so forth at night. This is something we probably will not be able to draw. What I'm going to have to do is take you on a tour of this. The only thing I can say that we've added to it is sand volleyball. <laughs> on top as a, as a nighttime activity. Uh, okay, so that's an added. So the dot is on land owned by the municipality. I'll show you in a map sometime. Land owned by the municipality. It's wedged behind Main Street, and it's a place that can be turned. It's very, very gritty. It's a place that can be turned into a certain kind of nighttime entertainment venue of the kind that can attract students from a great distance. The whole purpose of this is not an end, is not the, it's not an end in itself. It's to make this place cool, to get this on the radar. My timing for this is next fall. This should be done by next fall. So the students come back and the word starts spreading. Okay? That's, uh, then the second one is there's the Civic Square. Tom Lowe yesterday presented an idea of taking the square in front of the big building and the exhibition building which is a miserable parking lot and without the loss of a single car, turning into a beautiful square. Really beautiful, that is even, serves be even better the things that are, are happening under the canopy. That's easy to do. 
And I do think that that's, it's something that the, uh, the international uh, uh, furniture, uh, IBC, whatever. Every, everything has so many different names. IMC, that the IMC, IMC? International Market Center. International Market Center, IMC. Okay, I think the IMC owes you a civic center that is in the parking lot. You know, they're welcome to use it, they're welcome, you know, whatever, 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 but to actually arrive at a place that looks like a parking lot, I don't even think it's serving them well when the people come. You know, that's the connection between the two buildings. And if there isn't a, a loss of parking, and it looks much better, and it works better, what, why not? And I think we should, we should press them on this. Yeah. When I was talking to Max and, and Jason Ewing, who was my council people, they, they said the idea of closing, uh, uh, covering the railroad tracks from Maine to the walkway, and maybe doing it in plexiglass, so you could actually sit out over it. He had a really cool restaurant, Hero wants the depot, coffee shop area eventually. Do you know how much that would cost? Well, just in plexiglass. No, no, this is not East Germany. We're not taking orders and hoping that money comes from Moscow. Oh, okay? I thought it was your idea. No. Oh, because wouldn't it be cool to sit and like, watch the trains underneath? Not that cool. It's, it's not much cooler <laughs> to actually just stand right next to it, like they do in Greensboro and be frightened to death. Because you got two, <laughs> <laughs> you got two really nice retaining ones. We're not having any expensive ideas. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, Do you realize how that undermines a plan like this? Do you realize the amount of BS, silver bullets, that planners have foisted on people for the last 30 years? Do you realize why the planning profession is dragging the anchor, nobody trusts them, and why so many plans sit on the bookshelf? We don't do that. I thought it was your idea. No. No. Impossible. Well, I, I won't even pay for a fountain, to... let alone a bury. Okay. okay, now we do have a cool idea that actually costs very little. It can be done with a bulldozer. Okay. That does get you down on the train and frightens you just as well. <laughs> okay. By the way, as a result of pushing back, yes, I heard that idea, and then we pushed back and said, you know, it's got to cost less, it's got to cost less, it's got to cost less, and I think we have an idea. I think we have an idea for that. Okay, so then we have the downtown. Okay, the downtown, for all intents and purposes, do you remember uh, the... If I had a map, it would be great. Uh, I, you know, the old map have here. I can actually. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the the dot is here. Okay. Do you see? Do you see? This is Main Street. These are the two big buildings. This is Main Street. There's a little swap that comes in. You may remember. And back here. There's a lot of decrepit concrete, which is actually all these levels and cool things and chain link fence and all that. You know that at night you can light it up and have concerts. Okay, so that's that's that. Right the across High Street, right across High, High Street from the from the train station, back of the old nobles. Oh, yeah. Uh, so oh, can, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, under the center theater. Yes. What did you call it? Under the what? Under the center theater. Okay. The under, back of uh, at the back of the center theater. Mostly municipally owned. Yeah. You couldn't design a place cooler than that. You know, for dancing and concerts for kids. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Did you hear that? What? Say it out loud. Underground hockey. Yeah. yeah. Underground hockey. Right. Okay. Now, I forgot to say that if that doesn't work for some reason, there is across the way a block of empty parking lots in this direction. Which, no, it doesn't appear here. Which are the right size? By the way, an empty parking lot is a plaza. If it's really large, it's just a parking lot. The bigger it is, the worse it is. Walmart is the worst kind of parking lot. But when they get small, they actually begin to feel good. And there's a, a real checkerboard of uh, small parking lots just behind the bus station, pretty close to downtown those can be converted into the same kind of place if the first one doesn't work. And even if the first one works, there could be a second one. There's an expansion mode. And by the way, it all has to do with different kinds of bands and things. Remember, you have, you have festivals occurring 
already. What's the music one that happens in it called the beach? Flash. And, the, and the farmer's market. You're running your uh, entertainment here on, on parking lots. You're already doing it, except they're awful parking lots. You know, they're in the middle of nowhere. Just bring them in. A parking lot is a paved surface ready to go. So basically, I do not believe that in the long run, the parking lots here at the bus station will remain. Because hopefully we're going to raise the value. They'll be sold and developed. But there's a, there's a, there's a, a second part uh, that we can do there. There's a, that's a backup. Okay? Uh, then the third uh, element, which is the downtown. Okay, so there's going to be the dot plus. Okay, could you write that down? There's a second scene. Yeah. The civics where I spoke about, that's just negotiating with, uh, with, uh, with the big building people. And by the way, there's also an opening to the left, to the east, that opens out with some, some big sites there that is probably an excellent place to be reserved for an arena because there's call for an arena, there's call for a convention center, there's call for all of these things. There's no better place for that. It would be a shame if that were used for a one-story something or other showroom and then you were forced to put your arena in some suburban intersection. Okay, I think that our, that our master plan should say this is reserved for a major civic building. And if you don't do it now, it's still reserved. It cannot be thrown away, you know, with some kind of secondary building. Now, that's terribly important. You know, that's the cross axis to the east. It's a perfect civic site associated with the square. And because of the low real estate value, it might be sold, sold to a showroom. And then what do you do? And then you're forced to put the big, the big civic building when you're successful. By the way, we must assume success. Right now, it's very hard to imagine that you would ever get you know, one of these, uh, one of these big, big uh, gathering places. But if you do, that site should be reserved for that. Can't be wasted. By the way, it has a beautiful view over the landscape because it falls off. So, the Civic Square is associated with that. Let's add it. Uh, there's a downtown. Now, this area here, which is this one, where we are, and Kibbutz Street, this plus Kibbutz Street, that block, all the way to the telephone company building, which is now empty, but has a pretty nice parking lot, is your downtown. It's one, two, three. We're beginning to design them together, and um, there was mention of a children's museum, for which that empty telephone building is almost perfect. It's got high ceilings, and by the way, the, the parking lot in front is a perfect, really good kiddie park. Okay. You know, and by the way, the kids bring the parents downtown. So um, it's, all, it's already landscaped. The only point I'd like to make is please do something that is fun for the kids. And I can get into that later. But none of the things we come up with are fun. You know, not the kind of fun I had, where it was actually dangerous to do something. <laughs> you know, the seesaw that really went high and low. Okay, just buy insurance. Um, <laughs> The, that three block is called the downtown, those three blocks. And I think we can program it, but we need to decant the shops. We only have the, uh, the, crep, the crep shop. They need a wide sidewalk. It's pathetic. Wonderful crepes, really sophisticated, nice people sitting in tables this size outside. Okay? That sidewalk needs to be widened all the way down. And those, uh, those um, retailers that are there, closed mostly. Uh, unless they're cool, like the bookstore and so forth, they should be decanted, even with subsidy, into the, into the big building, because they're paying less rent. But that's the only chance you have for a first rate, for anything that's remotely like Greensburg, because that's where the shop fronts are. And that's called the Kibbit Cafes. I suspect they'll be principally food, food places. Yep? Um, I was just wondering if like a microbrewery would fit the yep. downtown area. Very. Of course, it's illegal, but we're going to get a... <laughs> I mean, you can start out small and expand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, it's a very good idea. Okay, so these are the Kevin Cafes. By the way, if you have a better name, that's cool. Okay, now, there's a children's museum I spoke about and a, and a really good play. Um, the Uptown. 
The uptown is up here, uh, highly developed. It's taking Main Street, uh, the crossing of Ferris, and then having a quarter mile walk that takes the neighborhoods, an enormous amount of people living in the two upper neighborhoods, they can, sorry, they can walk into here. And it's based on the, uh, on the inn, which is there. By the way, we discovered something this morning. Ferris, if you look at it, consists entirely of old historic buildings, about sometimes as many as, as much as 50% old buildings, and then new buildings. Most of the buildings north of Ferris have short setbacks. And most of the buildings south of Ferris have wide setbacks. That is because north of Ferris, they were, I think in the old days, they were expected to be shops. And south of Ferris, they were still the villas. And that's a characteristic of it. As soon as you see that, you understand perfectly which buildings fit and don't fit. And so this is going to be part of our coding. It's really subtle coding that is very specific so that over time, north of Ferris becomes a certain kind of place and south of Ferris becomes another kind of place. And then the whole thing ends in the library for which we're going to have a highly developed scheme. You know, which is a wonderful termination. So there's going to be a gateway in Lexington that signals for everybody crossing. If you're coming in, on, um, on uh, Main Street, and you're going through this sort of horror of sprawl, and you know, I can't tell you, I mean, it's awful. I can take photographs that are show you how awful it really is. Drivers coming in are coming in like this, just absolutely like this. But it's not even late model sprawl, it's out of date, decrepit sprawl, I and mean, it's just absolutely incredible. So you're coming in like this, barely holding on, and then it actually gets nice. It actually gets nice for half a mile. Do you think they have time to open up? They don't. You know, the, you know, the aperture doesn't open up. You're still like that, and then, and then it gets bad again for another half mile in your downtown, which I probably do notice. The reason we need to bring that street down and put landscaping on it and trees, <laughs> radical differentiation is so they open their eyes and say, I'm in another, I'm in another place. It can't just be a little tinkering. It's not enough to just bury the wires. It has to be the wires, the, 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 the trees, the burying of, uh, it has to be the wires, the trees, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the narrowing of the streets. It has to feel completely different. And then you say, I have entered another different place. Uh, we've had some pressure to make it nice up here. Say, why don't you keep going with your nice stuff? No, it's hopeless. <laughs> okay. It's completely hopeless. It would be incredibly expensive to retrofit it, and you would dilute whatever money you have. And besides, these people are happy being sprawled. These are all sprawl uses. You know, they need the drive throughs etc. It would always be mediocre if we tried to fix it. So we're just letting this go and taking the, the, the wire burial money and putting it here to actually pay for the trees, the curves, which were not expected originally. So, and as I said, this is already longer, quite a lot longer than the Main Street of Greensboro and even longer than the Main Street of, uh, of Winston-Salem, which is quite long. You have more than enough. You don't need more. So that is the Uptown, which is centered on Ferris and Main. And then there is the Library Project, which is dependent at the south, which we can make it a really glorious place. Uh, with your two great institutions at the moment, uh, which is, uh, of course, the donut store and... Uh, and uh, <laughs> oh, I want to say something really interesting. You say, why did, the, why did the library rotate the way it did? You know, because it's, it's a weird angle. And I said, well, because they were expecting decent planners to come later and see that, you know, that they're, they're actually ready to receive you when you come up north. It's actually aimed directly at the sign of the donuts. <laughs> so that when you're in a car, have you noticed that you can't see the entrance of the library? It's directly behind the side of the donuts. And of course, because it's closer, the sign of the donut is bigger than the entrance. And that's why that, that library looks so weird. You can say, well, what's that? Where do you enter? So that library needs a portico. 
since we're not going to move the sign to the donut, I've already tried that. That didn't work. Uh, there, you need basically a civic presentation, a port, you know, port cochere, at the scale of the distance at which you're seeing it. So you can actually notice that it's civic, and that probably has a, a terrace on top, you know, for the good days, so that you can come out of the reading rooms and see it. But the, the library does not present itself except as a back, because you can't see the entrance. And we have some really nice, we've actually resolved that block beautifully. So that's the library canopy. project. What? Another canopy? A what? Another canopy. Yes. Putting a canopy on, yes. Oh, actually I didn't think of that. Yeah, that'd be great. Get the same architect, because then you start getting a, a, kind of, uh, a kind of brand. I think that's a very successful canopy. Yeah. Exactly, good idea. Okay, we'll use that as the, as the uh, excellent idea. We'll use that as the, uh, as the, uh, so, you know, this is not, this thing of branding is important. You know that in the cities in Europe, the campanils of churches have a look, and there are variations of the look. Siena has a certain look, you know, and we used to do that in America as well. Like St. Augustine, if you look at the five towers of St. Augustine, Florida, they all have a very particular look. You know, the Bavarian villages do too. I think that the canopy, which is actually the best thing you've built in a long time here, and I think everybody knows it, right, should become a good presentation. Good, we'll Photoshop it. That means we don't have to design it. Okay, so there's a library project. <laughs> now, We've also, I think, been able to change. Uh, there was going to be a lot of money spent making the intersection just before the library a six-laner, which would have made it uncrossable, very much defeating our purpose of walking there. We know the city manager and the public works department are working on it. One of the things that's going to require is for Rick and Paul to balance the intersections. Instead of having all the traffic coming into that intersection, which is what all those six lanes were about, everything was being shuttled there is to take two or three intersections and balancing so that people actually turn in and out using the three available intersections, at least two. And Rick just did a problem, maybe if we have time today, Rick will show you, he's already done the analysis and it will work. Okay, which we didn't know yesterday, right Rick? He just did it and he, has, he did a, uh, he did a, uh, and then there's the Lexington Gateway, which is at the top up here, this is a gateway. I began to talk about this. Maine and Lexington has, this is much harder to do because there's a gas station there that's doing well. There's a, a public feud between several owners over here, you know, uh, about ownership. Uh, there's a business that's doing well already, you know, that kind of thing. But the idea is to incentivize these four sites to do something like that. Here's a trick of incentive. If you give an incentive to a lot, to a site, to one site, what the owner will do is say, I'll just raise the price. Because my old, little old site, was, you could do XR, now you can do free XR for your example from parking. And you know what that does? That actually makes it even harder to get everything done. Incentives are double-edged unless you use sunset. If you can say, you're going to get this break, often it's a parking break, often it's a pre permitting break, you're going to get this break. But if you don't do it within two years, you lose the break, that's when it happens. And I think that this feud here, which I'm really sick of hearing about, uh, this little feud, you know, if they don't get together and follow a plan, which is incentivized, in two years they don't break ground, they lose it, and they go back to their old feud, which is essentially worthless land. So that's the kind of thing. And you have to stick to this. You have to really mean it. When you give an incentive, if you don't sunset that incentive, no one will work. Everybody waits until the first somebody pioneers it. Who's going to go first? Let's see whether it's a risk or not. Okay. And I spent a lot of time with projects that took years to take off the ground, precisely because the incentives we put in place raised the value of the land so that no one could actually act. And then I learned about the sunsetting. You have to put a time factor on it. And then there is a college town. High Point University. Uh, we have a new person working here from my office that came off called Dylan Wassell. He did his thesis at the University of Miami 
studying the main streets of 40 college towns in America, many of which you know. Many, many college towns with main streets. The main streets are invariably immediately adjacent to the college, or the college actually straddles them. Okay, and, and the drawings are all done. There is actually no hope whatsoever that this college is going to reach the main street. Okay, we can call this a college town all you want, it won't be. It has to be something else. Because actually, the plan of this college is to only grow by 20% more to about 5,000 students. This is not going to lap up against the main street anytime soon at all. It's almost impossible, particularly because it's too, the real estate value is too high here. But they have lapped up against the college shopping center, the college village. This is their main street. Now, when we came here, and until very recently, we were trying to get the college to come here. And then I realized that, yeah, you can put a bike path, but it's not a college town. And so now we're taking seriously this college village and, and turning it into a really nice looking college town main street, you know, without knocking down the strip shopping center. And of course, unfortunately, they don't own it. You know, the college doesn't own it, but it certainly has lapped up against it already. And by the way, the green ways are coming in very nicely. So this is the college town. Not this. So whatever you heard earlier, forget it. This was just a vain hope. This is a completely independent situation, which is a mall looking for a use. It shouldn't be knocked down. It has perfectly good parking lots, mature trees, perfect drainage, large span structures. It's not. It's pretty durable. It's pretty new. Uh, this is the business incubator that we were uh, speaking about endlessly with Kennedy the other day to enable people, particularly young people, to start businesses. We spoke about uh, something called the pink zone, which was a, 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 a zone that lightens red tape so that the young people, what's preventing the young people from starting businesses themselves is that the red tape is horrendous. When we started businesses, the red tape was much lighter. I don't think I could have been able to do anything I did in my life if at age 26 I had to face with a 26-year-old space. It's just, and, you know, of course, if they don't find employment, I graduated in 1974. There wasn't employment there either. It took me about three months to start my own business. You know, we, we rented a, a cottage in a residential area, opened an architectural office, didn't bother the neighbors, right? <laughs> And then we rented the house next door, expanded to it, and then we rented three houses down. And we were careful with the parking, and we got to be a pretty, pretty big office on three houses. And we would just walk down the street in those days. You know, what were these guys with the paper walking up and down the street? Nobody was upset, we weren't causing problems, because that was a reasonable America. They understood that we weren't, architects are not an industrial use. Computers don't explode. You know, this idea that you can't even change the use from one thing to the other without throwing in the sprinklers and the things and the handicap, we could never have started a business. And one of the reasons, with all due respect, that so many of the kids, all they talk about is being artists, is that the only thing they can do without a permit is be an artist. Because they can't even bake a cookie and sell it. They can do nothing. So we have this plague of artists everywhere. And we've caused that. We've caused that ourselves. It's the only model they have. So the idea here is to have a incredible, my, my, my dream is that this extremely efficient organization called High Point University that has quadrupled in size in six years is able to get an idea like this one and recruit the 350,000 students, of which 60,000 are graduating every year, and bring them here because you know what, kids? This is the place where you can start a business. And this is the place where you can build a cottage. And this is the place where you can do this. And then bring in the apprentices, you know, the, the craftsmen and so forth, all the people that know how to do things. And turn this into a center for the entire triad area. Because it is the cheap space that the students always need. The cheap space without the renovation cost, you know, without all that stuff. And so this might be our first, our first pink zone, the first zone that's light on the red tape. And, uh, and uh, 
a lot of the kids in, in my office are, who are working here are most excited about this and they've programmed it in a really cool way. This is what happens here, this is what happens there, this is what happens in the third way. And this is, this is actually all the ideas we've had. The most world-class idea is, is the dot or the pit, whatever you call it, underground, uh, underground high point, which by the way is underground high point. Um, and uh, that could be world class, or at least regional. You're not going to beat Miami on that. Um, but this one could be world class. You know, just an incubator at the level of Soho in 1970 when people moved in and started their businesses. That's what we're talking about. And, okay, so that so we have these are the special projects, and then we have the transportation, which is always a special section. The road diets, the reconversion of the, a lot of your one-way streets to two ways to slow down the traffic, to give a chance to people to cross, etc. Uh, someone suggested that we do a uh, set up for a streetcar system, and we made a proposal yesterday, and it had deficiencies, and we redesigned it. It works really beautifully. So it's about, it's about now you have to make an application to get a streetcar, and then the hike bike system. Uh, which is a matter of bringing people in, and then once you're inside, if the, once you're inside our, our urbanism here, uh, once the uh, once the uh, traffic is moving slowly, then the bikes can share with the cars. It's just about getting the people in where the cars are moving from in, in the environment where the cars are moving quickly. In case of this transportation, this is all maps and numbers, and we have great engineers here, and then the procedures are. The green light and the and the pink zones. Now the green light zones are. And by the way, this is green light is going to look. It's going to it's going to be a light green shade in your zone. What it says here is if you follow the rules, you're permitted as of right. No procedures. Notify us of commencement and conclusion. You write a contract that you're going to do it right and follow the coach, but just go. By the way. You say, well, isn't that horrible? That is exactly what we did for the first 350 years of this country. Okay? It's the most effective 350 years we ever had. So let's talk about that. Let's remember that that's the way it was. World War II, by the way, was run exactly that way. <laughs> I've been reading about it. It's amazing. Um, the Green Light District, well, this would be, the parking lot would be Green Light District here. There may be other areas. We don't know yet. But what is more common, there's going to be a pink zone, which is a light red tape zone, in which you actually follow the rules, but they're lightened, in the sense that, for example, the bureaucracy, instead of causing impediments, is an enabling bureaucracy. Here, kid, give me your drawing. I'll make sure it works. And by the way, if it's not going to work, I'm going to tell you right now, not a month from now, that it doesn't work. You know, it's that kind of thing. If it's a no, it's a no, I'm going to torture you. And by the way, we're an enabling bureaucracy, and we'll take it to Raleigh if we have to, you know, to make it happen. So you completely turn around. I think you have a pretty high-grade bureaucracy here. Why are they doing dumb things like checklists? Shouldn't they be, be creative also? You know, that kind of thing. And so we have some pretty good legal help. Uh, and we're going to write, we're going to, genuinely, we're going to act pioneer this stuff, this, this software in this project. And then there's a new code. You have a new, you have a new code coming in, which is a monster. It's really fast. It's uh, extremely unpleasant to read and confusing. And we have a nice, uh, because they're going to take two years to get at it, and we can't wait, we're going to write what's called an interim code that's light and agile and clear. In the meantime, and if you find when they're finally done that you don't need it, then you don't have to implement the using one we wrote. And the code we're writing, including the definitions, we hope is less than maybe six, seven pages. Okay, well, be for, for, everything. for everything. For everything. No, more. 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 What's actually happened is that the study area expanded. You see, what's happened is that connecting this to this to this to this end. Right? So what's happened now with the code is that every single type of use, whether it's 
automobile retail, whether it's Main Street commercial, whether it's an entertainment district, whether it's residential, whether it's whatever it is, suddenly the code, which just yesterday used to be just what we do, now is applicable to the rest of the city if you want to. So it's basically a, a matrix. That you go <laughs> and uh, actually, I think it's a pretty good idea to call something interim. Don't worry about it. Let's just pass it. It's an interim code. You'll get your big one later. You know, it's, kind of, it's another way of coming in. And I've tried really hard to make a very slim code without frou-frou. You know, you know, I too can show off with fine writing. You know, let's do this. And let's, you know, I just, I just was ruthless taking off all that stuff to have a really, really efficient code on the basis that it's interim. And you shouldn't be using for two years your existing code because they, they, that existing code is a complete mess. You know, it's one of the reasons that actually this has become so incoherent. This business here, your existing Main Street, that model, the reason it's ruined is because of your code. The code has no, no context to it. So that would be the... I ask one question. Just going back to transportation just for a minute. In the southwest, uh, where I'm interested in, it's, it's industrial, it's severe decline. It's got a lot of middle villages with little uh, lane and a half ribbon roads. Right. Very few state roads that you have to cross. There. Right. Um, they're 25 miles an hour on there. We've been saying, and how do you get pop to it? You know, how do you... And if you would, if you would allow electric cars and golf carts, just in the southwest, you're not say, allowed. Oh no! But you know, but but electric cars are not allowed. The, uh, golf carts are not allowed on the street. Golf carts are not allowed on the street. And Mark McDonald told me that golf carts. He did not think golf carts should be on any street. But that would create. You can ride across the whole. There are golf carts on the streets of Miami. Please, please, would you? I mean, that would create a lot of. Not the highways. But the streets. Right. That would create a lot of easy transportation. Could we, could we write that? A lot of inexpensive Could you look up? There's different kinds of golf carts, too. There's the heavier ones and the lighter ones. There's, there's one category that's called a neighborhood electric vehicle, NEV. And it has decent headlights and brakes. Headlights? You can, you can buy one for yourself for $2,500. And by the way, country club. Okay, it's got to be able to climb a hill. Of course, okay, yes. You know, no, we don't have to do that. Good battery. What? Has to have a good yeah, but it only has to get a little very short distance. Yeah. It's the, it's the, um, sort of like the danger thing. No matter what for the golf cart, it is less dangerous than a motorcycle. That's not the problem. The problem is that it holds up traffic because it's too slow. So, but there's now a different kind of golf cart. Actually, they cost very. They cost a little more than twenty five hundred. Well, I just had a But they actually can actually speed up a little bit. I'll send you. I'll send you a picture. But they, uh, honestly, they can't be in every road. For example, it probably shouldn't be on Main Street. No. Or on Elm, but yeah. on the back road, they can cross over the yeah. streets. Yeah. 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 Okay, now, the code is an enabling code. It allows you to do things. There's very little in our report that is about incentives. You know, the idea that somehow <laughs> that mill is going to happen because we have an incentive. The only incentive we're doing is lightning the bureaucracy. <laughs> Big. That's all. It's not we're going to give you money or public-private partnerships and all that kind of thing. I think that's very 20, you know, it just takes too long to do that. And uh, it's too costly and there's no money anyway. So uh, it's just allowing you to act. Okay, so that's what we're going to show you. If you'd like, I'll, I can, do I have a slice? Yeah. Okay, you think about this and we will... Uh, There you are. Um, there was a lot of work. By the way, this is an unusually efficient charrette because so much work was done ahead of time, including the fact that Tom Lowe was here many times, uh, Peter Freeman's our partner, and he's been here all his life, and we, uh, I've visited three times before. So that was very helpful. Oh, I love this. Okay, I don't know who did it, but one of the things I said is the reason I don't write things down is that I don't want you to I don't want you to think that I'm a waiter taking your order. <laughs> because if you see me writing down, you think you're gonna get it. And that's not the way it goes. Most planners write things down and then people are disappointed and angry. 
Somebody actually used the restaurant <laughs> bill. <laughs> Somebody ordered up quite a few things here. I thought this was fantastic. Job, job, job. And uh, somebody also gave me this magazine. It's actually quite exciting. The uh, Make Fair, uh, uh, kids now making things, really making things, making robots, making speakers, making all sorts of stuff that to me, I mean, it's really, really very impressive. However, I'll say one thing. Nothing that magazine has good craftsmanship or sense of design. You know, it is like so dorky, all this stuff. And I think that that's what you could add. All these furniture designers could add the craftsmanship. So uh, this is one of your, pain, uh, your principal problems. You have two spikes of population. Two high points. Two high points. <laughs> Excellent. Two high points. You can't sustain any business this way. This is what happens when you have a baseball game. And that's, you look, at, look at how much more even it is when you have a baseball field. And that's still considered a disaster because of the space in between. This is a standard movies that at least fills, fills, uh, fills for the weekend. But this is what you really, and these are the schools. The schools, but the schools have summer vacations. And you know, the merchants suffer. What you really need is this, which is you need a mixed use population. You need people who live and work, and that's, that's what keeps the shops going, living and working night and day. It's really the only thing that works. If you want to sustain merchants that are local and not just the ones that have huge market areas like in the suburbs, it pretty much takes, uh, takes something like this. Uh, your location is spectacular uh, in the middle of everything. There it is. Look at, look at the system of highways. Uh, this, hey, why is this, uh, okay, this, I'm sorry, this is wrong. Uh, uh, within, within, within 60 minutes, there are 200,000 students. Within 75 minutes, there's 330,000 students. Right here. And these are the colleges. Does that include community colleges? Yeah. It includes 35 of them. 35 colleges and universities. This is absolutely astonishing. You have 75 minutes. They'll come here to party, and they'll come here to say if you, you know, they'll hear about this place if you do this right. Um, that's your biggest asset by far. There isn't even anything close to this in terms of the future for the place. Uh, and uh, these are the radiuses of the college. Now, this is really interesting. This radius, these are the radiuses of all, all the, the major colleges in North Carolina, all the best ones, the biggest and everything. If you look at their arcs, okay, here they land, you know, yeah, you got seven arcs. Look at the number of arcs here, in this, in this oval here. But look at here, look at this one right here, just to the north. That's where all the arcs meet, of the 35 universities, you know, Duke, all of them. It's amazing. Uh, this is the plan that we're working with, uh, and uh, anyway, you know it. This is the aerial photograph. It's actually pretty, uh, uh, it's pretty clear what's going on. There's this, and there's this, and there's this, and there's this, and there's that, and it's very clear. There's almost, there's almost no, uh, no overlap. I was, uh, something I learned this morning, I was actually having a confusion with Peter, and I, he wanted to call this downtown. And I said, yeah, but that's different from this. And he says, but that's not downtown. Downtown's up here. And actually, even in the old days, you know, the downtown, if you look at the shops and the residue, it's actually, you know, this was always something else down here, I think. We, we grew in concentric circles yeah. from North Main and I, half mile, then, then a mile, then three quarters of a mile. Yeah. We grew just like you drop a, peb a pebble in the street. And then you had a streetcar. Yes, yeah, which gave you the line That's out. That's the mile. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's, mile. Here's the history of American urbanism. You know, the, the original Main Street, the one that spread later, mm -hmm. and then which was killed by this one, which was killed by that one, which was killed by the next one. It's completely predatory. You know, the new mall kills the old mall, the old mall kills the strip shopping center, which is the college, the strip shopping center kills the Main Street. Amazing. It's, uh, anyway, it's not what they did in Europe. Uh, this is a diagram of your decent frontages, your decent, uh, 
your, where it feels good to walk, extremely liberally interpreted. You know, uh, mostly if this were by the standards of, let's say, Winston-Salem, you'd have a third of this for just being nice. It is very little walkable. But it's not that it isn't good when you find it. When you find it, it's good. It's just that it's not continuous. You know, you can't, you can't walk for five minutes and have a good experience. It's always good, good, bad, 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 good, bad. You know, and what we'd like to do is weave it together. Start by weaving three blocks together of uninterrupted experience. That's why we're trying to concentrate the work. Uh, these are your one-way pairs, which cause the cause the not only the cars to speed, they cause confusion, and they cause well. The main thing is they cause the cars to speed. They cause confusion, but also retail doesn't work when you only get half the traffic. Yep. Um, I live on Johnson Street in the historic area, and um, I've been wanting to be converted to two ways for a long time now. We're having a um, neighborhood meeting coming up, and some of my neighbors are a little skeptical about that idea. Can you give me something to say to them? <laughs> um, that The, uh, okay. May I use your immortal words? Okay. Rick was trying to explain it this morning. And he said, God made the world two ways. <laughs> <laughs> Every street was two ways. Of course, you had to go up and come down, right? And then in the 1950s, all the engineers went to a conference somewhere where the new books came out, and they said it's much more efficient if it's one way because of the left, left turn, turn. Okay. And that was when they loaded it when the car was more important than the pedestrian. Inadvertently, they also speeded up the cars and they destroyed the retail. Okay, you can't have a shopping center that has streets only in one way because you only get half the trade. It's precisely the friction. The, the, the friction between the two cars coming against each other that that slows them down. And uh, now you can make the argument: Who cares down here, right? But up here, it's terrible. The residential neighborhood. Any further? <coughs> yeah, Here's our preacher. Uh, <laughs> the, um, we we carry speed guns with us wherever we go, and uh, given same conditions on two streets. If one is two way and one is one way, the, the one way is always faster. They're just hands down every time. Um, there was a friend of ours in uh, Savannah, Georgia, that did some research in the historic insurance maps. When a street was turned from two way to one way, the number of addresses on that street went down. People closed their doors. And conversely, when you had the street go back to uh, uh, two way, the address that went back out. You see, uh, somebody came in with that with, uh, where, what was the street here? The number of accidents in the street, I don't know whether I have this slide here. Is it here? Okay, here. Is it coming up? Okay, later on I'm going to show you the number of accidents that result. What happens when the cars are speeding is if you approach the intersection and it's scary to, even to drive, so they would scary cross because you, are they coming, are they coming, are they coming? While if they were two ways, it's more, con you know, you say, but isn't it more confusing? Precisely. That's why people slow up, because it's more confusing. It's, it requires more thinking to do things. More driver awareness. You know, whenever you see an intersection that is a mess, and you say, oh, everybody wants to clean it up, Look, look for the incidence of, uh, of accidents. It's the lowest, because people approach it. Remember Five Points in Stewart? Mm -hmm. Five Points in Stewart, five streets plus a railway line, no accidents. It's the op it's, it's counterintuitive. OK. So what's this one? Uh, yeah. I'm one of the residents who lives on Thompson Street. Going to it, yeah. And the reason being, at least from my personal perspective, is that whenever you do whatever you're going to do to Main Street, and there's five, six, seven years, there's been a lot of discussion. Right. Whatever happens to Main Street is going to affect us. Right. 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 I'm 
Yeah, yeah say something. Have you thought that it might affect you positively? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, hey, I've been, yeah. I, I've been one of the ones that said, I think, Diane Posadas, when she did it, she was like, wouldn't it be great to go out and walk and have dinner and you know, yeah. whatever you want to do? Yeah, I'm all there. My concern, and you know, a lot of the other neighbors' concern, is first of all, the uh, deflection of traffic because everyone who runs through Main Street or has any desire to go from one end of the town to the other or come from Greensboro into High Point, right. they're, they're going to avoid that area like the play running from the new turn to you know, squeeze it down or right. whatever. Where is that going to put the traffic? Back well, on to us. When I've been trying, and many of our, our neighbors have been trying for years to get the city to reroute the traffic towards Centennial or another street, but we had nothing but resistance in, in so many areas that uh, the transportation is not just... Okay, but you realize that as we slow this down, if you keep your speedy, they will in fact go to yours. You need to slow it down as well. I'm not convinced that you will do it. Okay, look, there's your opinion and the right, engineer's right, opinion. Right. Fine. Have it out. No, we, no, no. I have okay. a question is how Trust. Let me put it this way. Okay, these are the two best engineers I know in the United States. Mm -hmm. Okay, they say do it, absolutely do it, no question about it. Mm -hmm. And we're just supposed to trust it. Yes, you are. Well, They're the what professionals. About, what about putting a conditional clause, like if we do something like that, can, for can a, it revert back? Yes. Or can it, uh, yeah. for a finite period of time, yes. then can we vote You should on test it, it for six months. Right. But mm -hmm. the fact is, if you don't try it, it's also fine. Exactly. You do it. You know, one of the things you have to understand is that at one point, I give the best shot and we leave. Now, Just like you think we do. We actually leave. Then it's up to you. So don't worry about us. We just give advice. Now, I hope that me and many of the other residents on the street are absolutely wrong. Yeah. I hope that we're wrong. Well, but why don't you just trust us? I mean, we live I'm here sorry, right? why don't you trust experts? What's the problem? Now, it's not that they don't trust us. I'm skeptical. And there are many others. <laughs> Yeah. So what is the basis? What is the basis of your knowledge? How many years did you study engineering? Sir, I did not study engineering. I've lived on the street for 30 years. How long have you been at it? For 40 years. 40 years he wrote the book. I'm just going by experience of living on the street. Well, let, let, me, let me explain just a few things real quickly. We, we understand the dynamic of traffic shifting from one street to the other in the interplay. But um, one of the problems, not only do you have one-way streets, but they are posted at 35 miles an hour. Now, we had to fight to get low to 30. Well, let, let me say, let me say. Do you know why? Because it's designed for 45. And because it's one way. And they won't put a stop sign. It doesn't anywhere. help. It doesn't help because it's the perceived safe speed is 45 to 50 miles an hour because it's one way. I'm We were talking with the engineers. Um, when you're on charrettes, you forget what day it is. Tuesday or something. And, and um, the thing they appreciated most is us saying that their design uh, down by the library with, with their, their large intersection on the side and the big roundabout, uh, that was all done with a suburban frame of mind on their part. They were thinking fast. Autos are only the thing that's important, but pedestrians are not important. Mm -hmm. But once you get that, that paradigm shift that I showed with that, that, uh, that base of fruit turning the other way the other day, but once you change your mind about how you're going to operate this entire system, then many things become possible. It's, it's illogical for them to lower your speed below 35 miles an hour when they understand that the policymakers above them, their bosses, are saying, get those cars moving through this neighborhood. And then, then the key thing, though, is once the policymakers, which they're doing now, are saying, let's get the pedestrians cared for, let's get the neighborhoods cared for, then a lot of things become possible. There could be a couple of four-way stops put in there if that's what it takes to oh, finally yeah. slow the speed down. Do you know what so I'm thinking about? Do some of those okay, things, look right? at this. They do have a problem. That won't be look at how long that goes. Yep. That's a really Quite long run. Freeway. That's okay, what's happening is that you're thinking, what can we do to stop it there or here so that they don't even enter here? 
the best thing for a for a, a walkable grid system is to keep everything open. Okay? You don't want to shut things off. Yeah, but this is unusual though. This one's unusual. But but there's what we find from the traffic counts, they're higher here and they get lower, 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 and lower because the traffic disperses into part of the network. The key thing is to keep it at low speeds when it disperses. And it doesn't become a raceway through your network. But you know, you know, so we do I think what things. we should do is actually not just slow it slow it up here, mm -hmm. but disincentivize its enter yes. earlier. Yes. Right. Right. Absolutely. right. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. disincentivize it because you see all the other streets and lots of grid streets, but only yours mm -hmm. really connects. Those are the deaf ears that have been involved. Yeah. 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 And it's because they were assuming the policy was the same. You see, that's the key difference that you should take take home with. The policy has changed. The policy yeah. and the policy is going to be lower speed, balancing all four modes. We call those the three forgotten modes of walking, biking, and yeah. transit. So when I first ride. came here, and I tried to understand the city, I was permanently confused. By the way, for some reason, the city is very easy to understand. It's got a lot of landmarks. You can see the big buildings and things. And I was, I couldn't get it straight. What was going on here? I just couldn't get it because. The character of this was different from the character of this, was different from the character of this, was different from the character of this. And I never could get it through my head that it was the same street. Do you see what I'm saying? It's a real hodgepodge of a street. But I think that what Rick says, first of all, you want it immediately. There's stop signs and there is uh, uh, making two ways. But something up here that makes him think twice. Right. about not going here. And by the way, the people coming down here are not shopping in our beautiful new Main Street too, which is why I'm, I'm concerned. Could we get them to come here and do some shopping on the way in or out? Yep. Yes. Uh, I don't live in Winston-Salem. I'm not in high point any longer. But I do come down here. And when I come, I come north. I come from the north of Pasadena. And I will invariably turn on Johnson Street if I'm coming downtown. And I miss all the north end. So Johnson Street is actually, and it goes out to Johnson Street extension, so it acts as an arterial coming directly into the downtown, and it bypasses all the stop lines. You've got a straight shot down from Martin Street. That's right, and, I, and that's why I use it. No offense to you guys on Johnson Street. I mean, I like Johnson Street a lot. I love Johnson Street. It's the same thing you do. But, but this, is, this is the way I come down. Just immediately eliminate all the traffic on Main on Main Street because it's a cluttered mess. I do the same thing. I don't want to. But on the other hand, for Main Street, the, the problem has been is that's a couple of hours. Now what's precipitating all this is now it belongs to the highway, right? And it's no longer controlled by the DOT. And so the, their concern is it's a flood, where. Our concern should be to, to make it slow enough that people can make a decision if they want to shop in these different I understand that's been the history, but it's less important than it's ever been. The Federal Highway Administration is talking about multimodalism, walkability, all of those kinds of things. Neighborhoods are saying, talk to the other day. No, no. Sometimes the states are the last ones. The locals get it, the states get it. The states have to Okay, now, one of the problems with charrettes is that I, I make proposals and then you fall in love with them, and then we can't deliver. Okay, sorry if we can't, but what I just told uh, Paul is, you know, there are three big streets here. There is Main, there is uh, Johnson, and there's Centennial. And what's happening is that this was a nice little old street until they extended it. And the really interesting thing to do might be to actually get intercept people at some point and take them to those who want to do the shopping in our cool, cool new Main Street. They go to they go to Main, and those who want to bypass go to Centennial, like that. That's the real choice. Because this is a pretty good bypass street all the way down. In fact, they can use they can use the trade because our our new, our new village center. So that's a that's a possibility. It's actually going to be, be more important because there's a there's an 
endeavor to extend and widen the Johnson Street north of Ski Club a great deal into the new industrial commercial area that's just been approved, which will flow even more traffic into High Point. You don't, you don't do something at that intersection you're talking about. And, well, I think everyone's going to have a harder time if we don't address that intersection. And you know when you say, well, isn't this longer? Okay, they'll say, well, isn't that longer? Yes, it's half a mile longer. And how long was your trip? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, when once you're in a car, distances mean nothing. It's just how, it's just per the perception that somehow this is shorter. So, but if we can smooth it out. And speed, too. Yeah, there, speed. Is, there is a counterpoint to this discussion also that somewhere along the way, density of people got a bad name. In other words, congestion is a bad thing. But there is no successful downtown that doesn't get congested. Two hours later. Yes. Yeah. Remember, we're looking for a parking problem here. <laughs> okay, well, that was one of the other concerns, was the fact that we did, we did the two-way, um, and there were people who were trying to to promote parking on both sides of the street. That's going to put us with the uptown project and put a bullseye right on us to uh, change the status of our neighborhood from residential to commercial. Well, we're going to be business parking. I think there may be some of that. Uh, do you have no parking now on the street? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But it's allowed. On my block, no parking on the street. No of course, parking really slows up cars. Yeah. Andres, for most of Johnson, they park on one side. What? Most, most of Johnson is parking on one side. Does it alternate? Yeah. They alternate, yeah. But the problem is it's so fast that people are afraid to park their cars on the street. Okay, let's, let's design a valve. There are lots of valves. And and the the fuse. You can have a valve up there. A diffuser. You can have a diffuser. Yeah. And just say this is a bypass. And, and some some horrendous impediment yeah. that actually just gets people both ways. There could be roundabouts because that would uh, make it feel just as easy to go one way or the other. Right, right. Perfect, perfect. Let's do that. Sounds good. Can you use some of the money that, that, you, that they're not going to spend on varying the lines to make the streets two ways? Do you think they'll be able to do that? Well, you know, it was going to be spent on the street to which it was allocated. You know, there was a bond issue yeah. that was for that street. This is another street. Yeah, so they can't. Well, I don't know whether they can. They, I don't know. I don't know whether they can. It sure is easier to keep it where it was before, but I don't know. But I think this is much more minor. What we're talking about here is, uh, you know, it's, sign, it's just signage. And maybe the expensive thing is that if, uh, if uh, Rick and Paul can, di can design a, a diffuser, you know, with signs, you know, something. Yeah. They're really good plumbers. <laughs> uh, they, they talk about making streets two way again. It's very expensive. I mean, that's what I've heard when it was green. No, it's not very expensive. Oh, that's not very expensive. Oh, you can do it. They pay consultants to estimates. It's supposed to be the traffic signal. If, if you're talking to the one person who is responsible for the traffic signal, yes. and that's all this person ever does, yes. then there is either no cost for leaving it the way it is. Or if you want to go two-way, then they have a cost. But relative to to all of the income for the city, for the, uh, the encouragement of the businesses and the, the, the big picture, it's this. Yeah, but that's that turning thought upside because that's not the way the thought is right now. Yes. Yeah. That's but what it's changing. That's what it's I hope so. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is the transit, second shot of the transit, and this one works. Remember? They all used to come down, it was, they were very long trips. This one now that goes like this, from East Chester, by the way, the stops are just like before Lexington, that Montlieu, which is the library. So it's, a, it's basically a figure eight. You know, they go like this, it's a figure eight. So actually the train is here. It means most of the time you can get, it's much shorter to get to your destination because it's a, you know, each of them makes a figure eight. Uh, this can be run with two streetcars. It actually could be run with one streetcar. You know, not that that's the cost. The cost is the rail, and then you can have two streetcars. And Rick said that as long as they never meet, as long as they're all going in the same direction, then uh, the, the cost drops. Also, you should do low-tech streetcars. 
you know, the ones that go slowly, feel good, etc. And uh, just remember when they say it costs a lot to do a streetcar, no. it lasts almost seven times as long. The equipment lasts seven times as long. The buses cost less, but they're replaced every seven years. Couldn't you use a hybrid or an electric trolley that looks like a trolley but doesn't have to have all It the still breaks. And by the, way, by the way, it's profoundly undignified. Yeah. Uh, it's like the whole idea that you know Americans are fools, and so they can't take a bus, so it has to look like a trolley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just the one in Charlotte, where miles cost like a hundred million dollars. Yeah. But that's a modern streetcar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you were talking about one. No, this is this is the more traditional streetcar. Okay. Yeah. Because there's a yeah. key difference. Yeah, we just got a fact sheet uh, to refresh our memories, and it said there is a uh, there's a modern streetcar, and then there's a traditional streetcar. And the modern streetcar, uh, traditional streetcar, had a high cost example in some city and a low cost example in some city. And, high, and the modern streetcar had a high cost, and they said, so far we don't have a low cost example of a modern streetcar. It just doesn't exist. It's, it's an oxymoron. It doesn't even feel as good. So they're, yeah, they're, they're sleek and they go fast and they're hermetic. Well, the low speed are the ones that everybody has up. They're the ones that the tourists take. New Orleans, San Francisco. What? The range is just um, for the cost of of a streetcar is so wide that we want to um, look into it a little further for this context. Two to twelve million dollars range a mile. No. Hey, one thing about um, the consultants matter. You know, you can get consultants that are uh, prejudiced to high tech. Mm -hmm. Nothing but the best for you. Mm -hmm. You know, and then there are people who actually. Uh, and by the way, many engineers love high tech. You know, that's their scene. Many architects love. love you know, because they understand the feel of a window that you can open. You know, they understand the feel of the window when you put your elbow up. You know, have you ever seen the photographs of the San Francisco and uh, New Orleans streetcars? And people are like this, looking out the window? That's cool. And then you see the ones that you're supposed to love, and they look like, you know, Concord. And you say, why would I want to take that? And even the, the rattle and so forth. But anyway, there are a lot of used ones, which might might be reason the reason there's so much cost. Yes. Um, you either started to or didn't answer what I was asking about. The, the, uh, as I said, the concern about being targeted at the point where businesses would try to you know invade the neighborhood. Um, and either you. Okay. I missed no. Or what happens with Target? Uh, uh, um, uh, parking is something that can be highly, 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 highly managed. For some reason, everybody fears the parking ticket. You know, the mafia that doesn't obey any law obeys the parking law. The New Yorkers that don't give a damn actually shift their cars and they stay up all night. Uh, in Miami Beach, what you do is you, say, you, put, you put out, you design the parking so it says zone two, and if you don't have a, a, a decal, you can't park there. It's one of the easiest things to solve. This would become this would become a zone uh, for parking of you and your guests. Okay, you and your guests, and you can park here if you have if you put a tag on it. Now the downside, you see what I'm saying? Well, listen, I'm trying to answer. Did you do you understand what I'm saying? But he has, he has a different question. He's afraid of business it. spreading in the Oh, business spreading. That's what he's well, that's about. zoning. That's well, that's zoning is not parking. Then you have the issue with the city not enforcing this. Well, that, then it'll then throw the bastards out. No, no. Okay, I cannot correct democracy. Right. At a certain point, it's beyond my pay scale. All right? We write no, the technology, just, we write the zone. If you can't trust your city officials, that's a different problem. No, I'm just asking your opinion as to how Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on what your government is. Throw the bastards out. How, how, would, how do you think this would affect I think there's, I don't know enough about your politics, but really, that's beyond my pay grade, whether your democracy works or not. Andres, here's he's asking, is he going to get zone commercial? It depends on your elected officials. We're not going to zone it commercial. No, no, I know. They, it, you can't do it. It has to go to the process. It has it's to be you guys. Right? No, it's never going to happen. Okay, the gentleman here who seems to know says it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. 
never going to happen that Johnson's going to become, yeah. become commercial. Our zoning certainly isn't going to isn't going to allow. Well, there's been discussions. Yeah, but, the, yeah. The, the strongest, uh, uh, the strongest prevention for commercial in your neighborhood is your diligence. Right. All right, neighborhood association, historic district status, and, and, and just absolute diligence. You need to have monthly meetings and have people rotate on the name of their alphabet, uh, alphabetical of the name to watch the newspapers and watch the city commission meeting. But there's one more aspect that I, I've actually learned. If any, whatever, if anybody can at any time apply for a commercial situation, they can actually sneak in. Because sometimes the diligence, you might be off somewhere, you, may, you might not receive the notification. What we do in Miami with our urban boundary, and the developers are constantly trying to break their boundary, there's a specific period every two years when it comes up for discussion. You can't even apply for any zoning change. You can't say you can never ever apply for a zoning change because that's not the way the law works. But you can say there's a date certain when all zoning changes have to wait for that. And it happens every year on the 5th of November or every two years on the 5th of November. Which means that the people who are waiting, you, you might say, hey, I really need something because of my therapist. And people say, yes, but wait. Because just bring it up on November the 5th. And then you can be sure that you're there. So one of the things I have learned about good government is that there's a, there's a steady, predictable cycle on which decisions are made. And they can't just happen at any time, because then you have to read the newspaper every day and worry about it. And I, you know, the, this, the way the smart code works, Every zoning category comes up for discussion every two years. You cannot even discuss a change. But every two years, like clockwork, it comes up for discussion. And then all the people who need a little rezoning come in at that time. And by the way, it may be that they can make the case. Here's a, here's a typical case. People get older, and they want, rather than go to the, to the assisted living, they say, I'd like to have a, uh, I'd like to be able to have uh, my garage apartment be rentable, you know, so I can have an assisted middle. And you say, no, 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 but there comes a time when actually that might be a good idea. But whatever happens is they're coming in individually and being beaten up by everybody. Basically, everybody comes out of the woodwork and you have an intelligent decision. And that's called successional zoning. It is expected that there's pressure to go higher. Okay, we're not born yesterday. We know there's pressure to go higher, higher density, more complex uses. What we like to do is to make it so that it happens at time certain. So the discussion can't sneak up on you. You know, you know. And by the way, if you want to have, if you want to change, you have to wait. Nobody says no, but you have the date when it comes up, and then you have an intelligent discussion.